Hey everyone, good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming out. My name is Danny. I'm one of the founders of BioBots. We build 3D bioprinters and bioinks. We're creating a future where patients with organ failures can receive customer placements built on BioBot 3D bioprinters and constructed out of their own cells. Now, we're actually closer to this goal than you realize. Already, researchers on the cutting edge are printing and implanting simple organs, things like skin, tracheas, and even bladders. But beyond replaceable organs, the biotech industry is beginning to take advantage of this technology by replacing cumbersome animal testing with miniature organs built out of human cells. Now, although the first generation tools have really shown us the promise of the field, today they're holding back the revolution. Think back to the dawn of computing. Large mainframes that filled up entire rooms, cost millions of dollars, and were operated by punch cards and teams of technicians. State-of-the-art biofabrication tools aren't that much different. They fill up entire rooms, can cost up to half a million dollars, and are operated by teams of specially trained technicians. Now, our founder, Ricardo, is one of those specially trained technicians. He spent the last several years apprenticing himself to researchers on the cutting edge. He's learned all the deep, dark secrets of what works and what doesn't. He started building the next generation device in his dorm room, where he enlisted my help. I studied computer science and biology at Penn, where I spent a lot of time building gene networks for genomic engineering. And together, Ricardo and I have built something incredible. Meet the BioBot One. We took something that used to fill up an entire room and shrunk it down to a desktop 3D bioprinter that's unleashing the biological revolution. This device features many characteristics with traditional 3D printers, but there's one critical difference. Traditional 3D printers use harsh processes like heat and UV radiation to cure materials. With bioprinting, there's one additional challenge, and that's curing the materials without killing all of the cells. And that's our key innovation. We've invented a new proprietary process that uses visible light to cure materials without killing all of the cells. Now, with traditional 3D printers have had standard inks for a while, and there's nothing like that. There's no equivalence in bioprinting, at least not until this week. Earlier this week, we released our first kit. It's a cartilage kit that's enabling researchers to print three-dimensional living cartilage really, really easily. It contains everything that you need in order to do 3D bioprinting, and I want you guys to focus in on that vial. It contains a special solution of a collagen, a natural collagen derived from cartilage, and it has, also contains our special secret sauce initiator, which catalyzes the reaction uh, using visible light. It turns something from a solid, it's from a liquid into a solid without killing the cells. Now, earlier this week, we really, uh, on Monday, we demoed the product for you guys, uh, printing a new year for Van Gogh. Uh, he's one of our favorite artists, and so we designed him a, a new year uh, using solid uh, sorry, uh, Autodesk uh, design software. We then ported that design into our software, which converts from a three-dimensional CAD file into instructions for the device. Um, and uh, that tells the device exactly what to do to print. Now, can we please, please switch over to the camera demo? The, our kit really here contains uh, several things, but before the, uh, before the presentation, we actually went ahead and filled the syringe with the cartilage polymer, uh, loaded, connected it to the gauge, loaded it into the device, and uh, we started printing. And as you can see, the device really contains a standard three-axis system that it shares with most traditional 3D printers. It allows us to move in X, Y, and Z. There's also this uh, pressure regulator here, and that's how we control the extrusion of the material. Uh, pressure feeds into here, and users can tune the pressure. For the cartilage kit to print at 150 micron resolution, you need 60 PSI, so that's where we're printing at. There's also one more key thing to note, and that's that there's a series of LED lights mounted in this cartridge. Now, those lights are what catalyzes the reaction. As soon as the material starts coming out, these lights shine on it, and it starts to, to cure without killing the cells. So, I mean, we, were, we, were, we didn't want to print another year for you guys today, so we actually we were sitting around last night trying to figure out what to print, and we realized that uh, we had one of the best nose models in the room. And so we decided to print me a new nose. <laughs> and um, please bring the camera over to my hands, if possible. Um, and as we, what we have here is uh, Van Gogh's ear from Monday and a new nose that I printed for myself. Uh, well, let's see, last time some people were telling me that they couldn't see. There we go. And you guys can take a look. So can we please switch back to the demo? Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it's key to note that although today we're printing cartilage, this chemistry that we designed is really modular, and it works across different tissue types. We've actually tested it across dozens of different tissues, and it works. So you can expect us to release new kits in the coming months. 
Now, this, with this technology, we're really targeting the pharmaceutical industry, where we know these devices can be used to build miniature organs out of human cells to develop, to re really reduce the cost and time of bringing new drugs to market. And you can only imagine the kind of change we can create. From one drug developed for millions of people in long and expensive clinical trials to drugs developed for individuals. Real, personalized medicine for the very first time in history, enabled by 3D bioprinting. Now, we, since our beta release earlier this year, we've shipped devices to some of the major institutions across the world. And these are people who are actively using our device, giving us feedback, and helping us iterate on our designs, as well as figure out which kits to release next. The device starts at $5,000, and our cartilage kit starts at $700. So now we'd like to invite you guys uh, to come out to, start up, to uh, the Startup Alley, come find us, where, and we can help you build, heal, and discover with life. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Judges, anyone want to jump in? <laughs> How is this not a biohazard when you ship it? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I forgot to mention in my slides that there's, you're the, there's a final step here that's mixing in cells. And so usually our clients have their own cells uh, that they grow. For the demos here, we are obviously not uh, mixing in any cells because we don't want it to be a biohazard. But when we ship, there's, no, there's nothing alive in these kits. These are just uh, polymers. Like I said, when I mentioned the slides, they're just a polymer for cartilage, and they're an initiator. The Even with your standardized inks? Sorry? You yeah. Can, okay. so you, yeah. So you can mix in your cells directly with those standard things. And that's what makes them standard, that you can mix in different cartilage cells from different people, and they'll work with this kit. Wait, where do you, you mix the cells in? Sorry? Where do you mix the cells in? Where? You actually mix them into, this, uh, into the <coughs> cartilage okay. bottle. All right. Yeah. Have you, um, have you better taste, tested it with people in the medical community? Yeah, so we've been, we've been, like I said, we've been shipping the device out since January, and we've actually, I mean, that slide that I showed, that was, uh, that's our, one of our like, the client list, and that, those are our beta testers. They're the ones who have been helping us develop these kits, and I mean, a lot of the insight really comes from having them use a the device. So you've seen patients. Oh, sorry, so these are, those are academic researchers, and yeah. they're, they're using the device to, it's not, nothing is going into people just yet. Um, we're really, like I said, we're targeting more of the pharmaceutical space. So for example, one of our clients is, uh, is using, not, not our cartilage kit, but is using the device to, to build miniature tumors. So before, he used to build these things by hand. And basically, he could build up to six a day. And that was sort of the cap. And he was the only person in the entire world that knew how to do that. Now he's using our device to build dozens of these, more than he knows what to do with them, um, in a very accelerated manner. And he's not the only person in the lab that can build them anymore. Anybody can, use it, can build them. And he's using those miniature tumors to develop the next generation of cancer therapies. How big of a market is your initial market versus having to require FDA approval to use? Right put it in human beings? That's an that's a awesome question. So we're actually starting with the pharmaceutical industry because it is uh, preclinical drug testing is a pretty large industry. And uh, to put some numbers behind it, if, if you will, um, we believe, I mean, it's around a $7 billion preclinical market industry. And we can, cap, we can grow that a bit and capture around between 1.4 and 2.8 uh, billion of it, just based on how many assays and how many bots we can ship per drug that's being developed. And there are other technologies for growing tissues. So what are some of the competitive, you know, who's your competition? Yeah. And what are the advantages of your technology over some of the competitive approaches of tissue growing? So one of the, one of the ones that, I mean, definitely the biggest player in the space and the one that we've been getting tweeted at uh, throughout the conference is Organovo. So they've, um, they've developed uh, some bioprinting technology in-house. And they, they actually just uh, started selling these uh, miniature livers for preclinical uh, drug toxicity screening. And um, it's, it's great technology. However, their business model is radically different than ours. I mean, we don't know how they build their tissues. It's sort of like that's their secret, but they definitely don't use visible light. But um, their business model is to just sell those tissues. So they spent a lot of money on R&D developing those, those tissues, and our strategy is a lot different. We, are, we enable everybody, every pharmaceutical company, every CRO to have the capabilities that Organova has and develop their own tissue assays in-house using these standard kits. How long have you been developing the visible light technology, and is it defensible? or? Do you have any patents around it? Yeah, so we, we have filed patents around it. I mean, the company's been around, as you can see, since August. It started out in, uh, in our dorm room at Penn. We were living on top of a bar. A friend of mine, Ricardo, he was working in the space, and we realized that there was a huge need for this. So we started working on it right after I graduated, and um, so that was in May of last year. That's sort of been the progression. So yeah, there's been a lot of happening. What was, what was his original inspiration for it? 
Yeah, so he was, uh, he was working in the lab. He was trying to build uh, three-dimensional blood vessels. And the tech that he was using was pretty primitive. It was like uh, he was having to do it by hand. And he wanted a 3D bioprinter. So he started looking around like, crap, like, what can I, how, do I, how, do, how do I get one of these? But they were all huge. Um, like, the lab would have had to build an entire separate room to house the thing. Um, the, cost, the cost was like 350K, and there was no way that it was going to happen. So he, came from, he had a maker background, like had been in the maker community for a while. And he started hacking on one on his own. That was the inspiration. It was like, I need the thing, and I can build it, so I'm going to do it. What do you think it would take for, to convince some, someone like L'Oreal or P&G or one of the Fortune 500s to use this instead of animals to, to experiment on? So it's, I mean, great uh, that you mentioned the, uh, like the cosmetics companies, because actually there's, they don't need that much convincing since it's illegal to test these, com these compounds. They're, they're cosmetics on animals on, all over Europe, so that's just illegal, and they're looking for really good three-dimensional models that, that work, that are better than the monolayers and the basically homogeneous tissues that they're growing now. So they are looking for technology like this. And we have had a lot of conversations. I mean, that's what's, th like, this doesn't exist in a vacuum. We've definitely been talking to not just cosmetics and not just beauty Which companies. Which companies are you talking to? Um, basically, every big pharma company in the space right now. So I don't want to, like, name drop them all, but yeah. So, uh, in a few years' time, when this becomes more mainstream, help us visualize where uh, the, the, this equipment is going to be, who's going to be using it. So there's gonna, there are going to be um, a lot of R&D researchers in pharmaceutical companies using these to build these assays. And um, I mean, part of the vision here is that you're returning something that's currently done manually into something that's done on lines of code. So that's valuable information that we can track and do analytics on. So that's one, that's one use case. And definitely in a few years, we do expect to have these in the clinic, not printing things for implantation, but using them as a diagnostic. So let's say that, I mean, we know that uh, you know, tumors and cancer is, is very different uh, for different people, just genomically speaking. And doing genomics on it is, is a great approach, but it's, we, still, we don't really understand the like, full genomic and epigenomic landscapes of patients. So with this technology, you can have patients come in. We can grow, we can 3D bioprint their miniature tumors after we biopsy their cells. And we can actually personalize which therapies they, they are going to work best for them. Instead of running these experiments in silico, sort of on a computer, we can actually physically do them and figure out um, you know, how they're going to react to them. So we're talking about, uh, I mean, uh, clinicians, uh, not, not necessarily clinicians, but basically specialized labs in hospitals or centralized institutions, and also a lot of pharma R&D folks. We also have, we do have a few medical device companies who have begun working with this technology, and it's really exciting to see how that matures. Um, there are a few clinics in less regulated parts of the world that are using these also to begin to develop skin um, for implantation, although that really hasn't, it's, it really hasn't happened yet. So <laughs> you can follow us and we'll let you know when it does. Is the future of the company, is it building more of the machines, or is it getting better at the processes for doing so and making the materials better and stronger? So, I mean, this is a, it's really want to develop a wide catalog of different materials that you can use with the device, sort of standard inks that make it really easy for, I mean, we're, we're basically trying to demystify or like take the expertise of developing your own materials out of bioprinting. And that's what we're doing with this cartilage kit, and we expect to be doing that with different tissue types. So, yeah, we're developing new hardware. Um, new, soft, new, new bioware, or wetware, liveware, whatever you want to call it. And um, we're building new software to begin tracking everything that's happening with the device. So building this database of standard assays that people are running for drug development. And that data is going to be really valuable. Mm -hmm. and it, I have a question about the technology. Is the fundamental difference here that using the light technology, you're dropping the cost to have a more accurate, um, cheaper piece of cartilage? Right, so the enabling technology is light. That's the fundamental key difference. What we've done is we've taken, I mean, using like the maker approach, taken things that are really, usually really expensive, so the hardware piece. It's usually normally really expensive to build just because people manufacture things differently um, nowadays than they used to. And dropping the cost enables, uh, sort of opens up the opportunity to begin pushing the technology out there. And having the kits is really the, the, is the brings the whole thing full circle. So, so th this may be a rudimentary question, but it's just not my, it's, it's not my area of expertise, but why doesn't every other 3D printer mm -hmm. um, actually become a competitor to you? Because if you, it, it seemed that there was a little bit of fuzziness at the beginning, but it seemed that your predominant use cases for research, clinical trials, et cetera, not about putting something in your body. So if it's been used as a, essentially a model uh, for some other purpose, why isn't a better maker bot a competitor? Because those uh, traditional 3D printers are printing things in plastic, and you really, you do, it's a very different system to have to print things, to print living cells without killing them. And 
we've developed a technology that allows us to do that, and we've patented that. But other than that, I mean, our dis ju us distributing the technology is what acts as a barrier to entry. Having um, our clients use them and give us feedback and really become embedded in this ecosystem that we're creating for them. So the technology you've built is the light, is the light printing right. technology, which is different from the cell, right? Well, so it's all, it all comes to, you need to have, you can't have one without the other. Okay. You need to have the, you, I mean, basically the challenge is turning the solution with the cells inside of it from a liquid into a solid without killing everything inside. And visible light is what we've developed to do that. Okay, now I get it. Cool. Is it still a question mark as to which tissues will work with this? Yeah, so, so we're, like I said, we're we, we're de we just developed this cartilage kit, but our clients are using it for all sorts of different tissue types, bone, kidney, liver, heart, Could brain. Could you print a hamburger if you use like cow cells? Sorry? It's a hamburger. Could you print a hamburger? Serious uh, question. It's like so something eventually None, none, none of our clients have printed out a hamburger. People have printed out hamburgers with bioprinters before, not in our device, though. So. And it, it's a combination of living tissue and some synthetic. Is that? Uh, so th it's... In this case, this, this one's actually naturally derived, um, the cartilage kit. But yeah, um, you, can actually, you can actually also mix in synthetics. Do you foresee any regulatory issues, like getting this past the FDA in some use? So the FDA is just getting their head around how to regulate 3D printing. We're talking to them about how to do this. It seems like the way they're going to do it is regulating the process. So actually regulating, I mean, not necessarily the device itself or the inks themselves, but the process of doing a bioprint and using it to diagnose something. It will be hard. So unfortunately, we're out of time. That was a great job. That was BioBots.